Clive Goodman was an English journalist, a former royal editor, and a reporter for the Murdoch Rag News of the World. And he was actually arrested in August 2006 for intercepting private messages of members of the royal family. And he went to jail in January 2007. Now, Prince William was pretty integral in all that happening because he actually managed to identify that one of his messages had definitely been hacked. Now, why am I bringing this up? Why am I bringing up Clive Goodman after all these years? Well, in the course of researching another bigger story that I'm developing, I stumbled across a bit of information about Clive Goodman that just made me go like this. And it made me go back and read Paul Burrell's book that was published in 2003 again because it put a completely different slant on everything. It made me think completely differently to what I had been thinking. Now, my impression of Paul Burrell has been very prejudiced by Bauer's book, The Rebel King, because that's very damning and derisive about Paul Burrell. It just does not paint him in a good light. But this new information that I got about Clive Goodman made me realise, it made me wonder, it made me think, hang on, maybe this was a bit of a stitch up. So I went back, I found what I found, and I'm going to share it with you this video. So I need to set the scene before I give you the goss on Clive Goodman and Paul Barrell. I've got to sort of tell you about a period of life that Paul Burrell went through that Bauer doesn't really emphasize in his book. And that's another thing that actually causes suspicion. It's like Prince Harry in his book when he left out huge gaps of time in the timeline where it was usually where he was having happy times with the royal family or good times with Catherine and William and they would just be absent from his book. Well, in Bauer's book, this period of time that Paul Burrell lived through is not referred to in any great detail, yet enormous detail about Burrell's subsequent court case and arrest and all that sort of thing. And that always makes me suspicious. When there's a big gap in something, I always go to try and fill in the gaps. And it was filled in for me with Paul Burrell's book. Now, I'd never given him much credence I'd flick through his book before and when it first came out, I remember actually reading it. But, you know, I just felt it was self-serving. I thought it was like an excuse for the arrest and the court case and everything. But now, as I said, going back, fresh perspective, fresh eyes, and I actually believe him a lot more. Now, after Diana's death, Paul Burrell was appointed as fundraiser and event manager for Diana's Memorial Fund. And he describes throughout that period of time this sort of snobbish sort of attitude towards him. And again, when I first read it, I thought that was just self-serving and paranoia. But now I'm not so sure. And he describes, I'll just let him say in his own words what he experienced in the offices of the fund. So he describes, um, I was a butler with delusions of grandeur who was getting too big for his boots. An overwhelming desire to cut me down to size and squeeze me back into some sort of livery where I belonged. And then later he says, I felt I was treated as the butler who was fast becoming a nuisance. Now, they thought he was a nuisance because he was quite uh, vocal about how the funds funds should be spent. He was very mindful of what Diana would want, what Diana liked, what she would, how she would want it to operate. And one of the things that he did was he personally went on weekends to receive the checks, to receive these local communities were raising money for Diana's Memorial Fund. And he thought it was really important that someone from the fund actually turned up and accepted the checks and made it you know, like it mattered because people were expressing their grief for Diana by raising money for good causes. And he felt it was really important to actually turn up, be the face of the fund, be someone that knew Diana and to gracefully accept the funds that have been raised by these communities. 
Now, Lady Sarah and others at the fund, she was president of the fund, started to get their nose out of joint because he started to get a little too much attention, a little too much publicity because, of course, the local papers would take photos of him turning up to accept the cheque. Now, I'm under no illusions. I'm sure Paul Burrell's got a, quite a big ego. Uh, it's been proven that he loves attention. He loves being on TV. But it's interesting because that real fame chasing that he did, that didn't happen until post-trial. And this is way before any of that trouble. And I really believe that he was trying to do a really good job. I think he knew that if he went and accepted checks in, from local communities on the weekend, that it would actually raise the awareness and it would enable more fundraising and more good works to be done. And I really do think that he was trying to do just a really good job as a fundraiser and an events manager. So he describes some really awful things that Lady Sarah uh, allegedly said, Lady Sarah McCorkendale, who was Diana's sister. And she was the president of Diana's Memorial Fund. And she said things like, remember where you come from, Paul. And these are in quotation marks. Another thing in quotation mark, look, Paul, stop walking around like the walking wounded. We're all grieving, you know. But see, the thing is, I don't think they were really grieving as much as Paul Burrell because I realise now that a lot of, uh, look, she wasn't even talking to her mother. Leading up to her death, she wasn't even talking to her mother. They had a very fractious sort of relationship. Lady Sarah was a lady in waiting to her when she was still married to Prince Charles, then Prince Charles, but I don't think she was terribly really on the scene after um, Diana was divorced and was doing her own thing. And as far as Charles Spencer, with that very heroic speech that he did at the funeral, which I applauded that I was so impressed by, Paul Burrell says she only saw him 50 times throughout her whole marriage that they weren't overly close, he wasn't overly supportive, and Paul Burrell seems to think that that speech was pretty much motivated by guilt because the summer that she actually died, she'd asked him if she could take the boys to Orthop for her and stay in the garden house on the grounds of her childhood estate, and Charles Spencer had actually knocked her back. Now, all this came to a head and Paul Burrell's getting more and more attention and it's just not going well. And he gets called to this lunch from Lady Sarah McCorkendale and her legal representative and they're more or less giving him the shove in a nice way. But Paul Burrell knows that he's being shoved out and he gets up from the table very upset, hops in a taxi, sobbing, and nothing was resolved in that actual lunch. Nothing went too far in that actual lunch. Now, this is where it gets a little weird. Clive Goodman contacts Paul Burrell and says, oh, I hear about your immediate redundancy. And Paul Burrell's wondering how they could have possibly known. Now, he had confided in Richard Kay from the Daily Mail. That's a completely different paper. He trusted Richard Kay and Richard Kay did not print it. And Paul Burrell knows that Richard Kay wouldn't have betrayed his confidence, especially not to Clive Goodman from a rival paper from News of the World. He just knew he wouldn't have. So how did Clive Goodman know about this so-called immediate re redundancy, which he hadn't even got yet? Only, the only people who were at that meeting were Lady Sarah, the legal representative, and Paul Burrell himself. And he's not going to tell the News of the World about his immediate <laughs> redundancy. So that was interesting. And that sort of made me think, ah, oh, that's a little weird. That's a little fishy. But in the end, he gets the sack and he goes off and he's living a, a relatively quiet life because his big publicity tour thing didn't happen until post-trial. So this is pre-trial. He's in a florist shop. He's living with his then wife and two kids and, you know, not, nothing too obvious about him. But after a few years, he gets another phone call from Clive Goodman. And this one was quite sinister. This one is asking him 
about missing diamond earrings of Princess Diana. Now, Paul Burrell says that he was with Lady Sarah and they went through all of Diana's jewellery and it was all dispatched to the proper places and it was all accounted for. Now, as if they're going to let Paul Burrell go through her jewellery without them and as if they're going to let it not be accounted for. Plus, keep in mind, this is like four years after Diana's death. So why is it all of a sudden discovered? And Paul Burrell felt uneasy. He felt under threat. He felt like there was something coming down the pike. And oh boy, it was. The police turn up at his door, knock on the door, enter his home and start going through everything. And as you know, he was arrested because they said that he had possessions of Princess Diana that he shouldn't have had. And there was a huge court case. But Paul Burrell points out in his book that what he thinks all that was about what the call from Clive Goodman was about with the diamond earrings, that Clive Goodman had maybe, let's say, intercepted some messages about a stitch-up about Paul Burrell because they wanted the police to get access to his home because they wanted to find the tapes that were missing from the mahogany box that he'd returned to Lady Sarah and she wanted the tapes. She also wanted James Hewitt's signet ring and she also wanted letters that were from Prince Philip. But Paul Burrell, you know, states, I don't have them. And to be fair, when they searched his home, he didn't have them. There was nothing there. He did not have those items. Now, the mahogany box that all these items had been contained in, these very fiery tapes that sort of painted um, Prince Charles's assistant in a very bad light. He'd been accused of raping George Smith and they were on these tapes that Diana had made. She'd put them in this mahogany box and locked it with a key and Paul Burrell knew that they were there. But Lady Sarah also knew they were there and she'd asked Paul Burrell to take them home to his flat in KP at the time and keep them safe. Now, Lady Sarah complains that he didn't ever return the mahogany box and that when he did, it was empty. But this is years and years, years later. So someone has got suddenly very concerned about this and is of the belief that Paul Burrell has these and it seemed like a bit of a stitch up that the police were accessing his home and going through this for this huge search. Now, as you know, the case was dropped. The Queen intervened and the case was dropped. And I always just thought the Queen intervened because she was trying to save embarrassment for Prince Charles. And that probably is the case. But isn't it interesting that there might have been more truth to what Paul Burrell said? And who was it? that Clive Goodman was having some sort of connection with. And if he wasn't having some sort of connection, was he actually intercepting Paul Burrell's phone? Was he intercepting Lady Sarah's phone? Was he intercepting Mrs. Francis Shan Kidd's phone? Now, the other interesting thing that I'll finish with is that Mrs. Francis Shan Kidd had a lot of very interesting phone calls. They used to say that she was quite uh, chatty <laughs> after lunch, if you get my meaning. And in another story that I'm investigating, it appears that she quite frequently phoned Piers Morgan. So I don't know, but I do think that Clive Goodman's involvement and his subsequent calls to Paul Burrell does open it all up to more questions. Tell me what you think. Tell me, do you think it changes how you feel about Paul Burrell? Do you think that the bit of the conspiracy theory that he was trying to present as a defense in his book might actually have some legs? I'm really interested to see what you think and I can't wait to see you again. Bye.